on this edition of Native Report. We visit the Stockbridge Muncie Reservation and learn about the history of the community. We learn about the legislation behind the National Museum of the American Indian. And we travel to northern Minnesota where we learn about the cooperative process between Native nations and Minnesota governments. We also learn something new about Indian country and hear from our elders on this Native Report. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Medwakanton Sioux Community, the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe, and the Blandin Foundation. Welcome to Native Report, I'm Stacy Thunder. The Stockbridge Muncie Band of Mohican Indians were originally located on the eastern seaboard. But over the years, they were pushed from their homelands and forced to uproot and move many times to the present home in east central Wisconsin. Their story is one of community and resiliency. On the summer day, the Arvid E. Miller Museum and Library is the ideal setting as Stockbridge Muncie President Robert Chicks discusses the history of the reservation. The tribe is uh, known by uh, various names over various periods of time, but we are, um, we are Mohicans. Um, we are, I guess, legally called the Stockbridge Muncie Band of Mohican Indians, but uh, we, are, uh, we are the Mohicans, which not to be confused with the Mohicans from Connecticut. Um, if you think about the present day capital of New York is Albany. Well, Albany was also the uh, traditional historical capital of the Mohican nation. And um, by reference, when Henry Hudson, uh, like in 1609, came up what is now the, called the Hudson River, uh, it was uh, the Mohicans he met um, uh, right in the Albany area. So that was where uh, our ancestors um, uh, said they hung the fireplace, the center of the nation. Those ancestral lands were lost as the Europeans encroached ever more into native territories. And after being forced to move several times, the band were settled near Lake Winnebago. But the state and federal governments had other ideas. Apparently, uh, the state wanted that land and they were gonna try to move us then further west to Minnesota in uh, a few of our uh, leaders back then went to Minnesota, came back and said, no, you know, we, you know, you've been promising us this and promising us this and we, we don't want to go there, but we want a permanent home like we've been promised. Uh, so in 1856, uh, through a treaty between the United States and the Menominee, uh, Menominee Nation, they um, ceded, you know, a, uh, an area that's roughly two townships to the federal government who in turn then signed a treaty with us. And so in 1856, the reservation here was officially established. This is a representation of Stockbridge Muncie community. This is our reservation boundaries. It is the full two townships. We're located in Shawano County in the t two townships of Bartlemy and Red Springs. We have been very aggressive over the past two decades here, 20 years, uh, re reacquiring lands within our boundaries. Uh, the only way we can, you know, we can get it back, get back the lands that we had lost, we have to buy them back. And the, the primary focus for the reacquisition of these lands in the northern tier is forestry and forestry related. We need to have income. 
we want to maintain the northern half as forced. There's no ho no more housing uh, will be made available in the northern tier than what was already there. It designated, you know, for wilderness, forest protection, so on and so forth. And then housing development and any business development will be done in the southern half where it's less forested. Like many Native nations, the past is not the past for the Stockbridge Muncie, as traditions are kept very much alive in the present. One is the honoring of their nation's veterans. I believe uh, uh, that our tribal members have fought in every war since the Revolutionary War on the side of the United States. And I think it's fairly well established and, and maybe not well known that as a percentage of the population, American Indians tend to um, uh, have a, a greater percentage of their members in service than, than any other group of people. Um, we have uh, a huge um, uh, veterans uh, organization, and we can veterans, and um, they have uh, a, a place down by our health center where uh, there's a wall with the names of all the, you know, the veterans going all the way back to uh, pre-revolutionary times, I would guess. And, um, uh, and so there's a great honor among all tribes. Uh, the, the warrior uh, was uh, uh, really held in, in high regard. About two years ago, um, since this, this is the anniversary of the Civil War, um, a woman in Shano, which is a town close by, put an article in the paper and listed a lot of names of Civil War soldiers. And my great-great-grandfather was on that list. And so I called her up and very, I was very surprised. I didn't know he was in the Civil War. And then I found out his brother was also in the Civil War. So she gave me some information. They had a ceremony in the cemetery in Shano to rededicate some of the headstones that were missing. And there were 80 soldiers that, they, that re, were rededicated. Of all those soldiers, I believe there must have been, I, I knew my great-great-grandfather and his brother were there. But on some of the names you could see there were Menominees and there were other tribal people there. I did articles in the paper to find information from our tribal membership, uh, and I came up with 58 uh, Stockbridge Muncie men who were in the Civil War, and five brother town Indians who were married to Stockbridge women. And so I, I'm sure I have more to go through, but it's been um, just amazing. President Chicks, and by extension the Tribal Council, is committed to ensuring there are opportunities for the enrolled membership of the Stockbridge Muncie Band. I'm very humbled by it always and to think that uh, your tribal members are in, in effect investing all of their history in, in you know, the members who serve on the tribal council is a very humbling thought. And so you take that with you every night to the pillow and hope that um, uh, you're always doing the best to make sure that the next generation is here and the generation after that, and still making sure that there are the basics uh, for uh, the safety and welfare of your, of your current tribal members. And it's a big challenge. Um, there is a, a symbol uh, called the Many Trails, uh, and um, uh, it was designed by uh, uh, one of our tribal members, uh, Edwin Martin, a number of years ago, uh, in it symbolizes uh, the, the many sort of kind of directions and trails it took for us to get here. And you can see different things in looking at that symbol. Um, certainly you'd be able to see the struggle and, and the difficulties, but you don't see, also see the recognition of Christianity. And uh, there are a number of churches on our reservation, uh, but, there, uh, but there's also the resurgence of the native culture. And there's no reason that anywhere that, you know, there can't be coexistence. And it takes some time, takes some time 
for uh, for for a cultural group to kind of re go through that metamorphosis and and remember uh, the strength and the wonder of of what it means to to be a Mohican person. Did you know that Patricia Zell served as Chief of Staff for Senator Daniel K. Inouye on the Senate Indian Affairs Committee? Senator Inouye had a deep commitment to Indian Affairs and served as Chairman of the Committee from 1987 until 1995 and again from 2001 until 2003. Under his leadership and with the help of Patricia Zell, scores of bills benefiting Native Americans were passed, including the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, the Tribal Self-Governance Act, the Native American Languages Act, and many, many more. In every area from education to health care to housing to religious freedom, Senator Inouye worked to improve Indian country. A decorated combat veteran in World War II, Inouye represented the state of Hawaii since it became a state. Sadly, Senator Inouye passed away in December of 2012 at age 88. A statement released by the National Congress of American Indians noted, Senator Inouye was one of the most honorable and courageous men modern Indian country has known. Next, as Chief Counsel for the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs, Patricia Zell witnessed firsthand the legislative process behind the establishment of the National Museum of the American Indian. This is a behind-the-scenes story seldom heard. On this morning at the National Congress of American Indians annual gathering, Patricia Zell is discussing her role in many policy issues affecting Native nations. In uh, 1975, I learned about the American Indian Policy Review Commission, which was a two-year commission set up by uh, the House and the Senate of the United States to review Indian policy. And Indian policy hadn't been reviewed comprehensively since uh, the 1930s when the Miriam Report was issued. The commission issued its report to the Congress in uh, July of 1977 and had, I think, 110 recommendations. Those recommendations became the impetus for the reestablishment of the Senate Indian Affairs Committee. Senator Inouye assumed the duties as chair in 1987, and there was an increase in the number of senators wanting to serve. Of the many pieces of legislation Patricia worked on, the one that stands out most had its beginnings in New York. There was a, an avid, somewhat uh, almost demented collector who was in, uh, came out of New York. His name was George Gustav High. And he amassed a collection of over a million objects and artifacts of, of, from Indian country. He would go into uh, Indian country, into a reservation, and he would buy everything in sight, cooking utensils, clothing, everything. And he amassed this, this great collection. Uh, kept it in his apartment in New York. His wife said at one point, uh, you either put this collection someplace else or I'm leaving, and he chose the collection over his wife. And ultimately, a, a museum was built around, not was physically built, but um, and housed that collection in, in New York for many years. Um, it was called the Museum of the American Indian, and um, this is what was the seat of the museum. Uh, Senator Inouye assumed the chair of the committee in January of 87. One month later, in February of 87, the committee held a hearing on a bill to provide for the repatriation of Native American human remains if they were found on federal lands in the national parks and the Forest Service lands. Uh, that was a bill introduced by Senator John Melcher. And in the course of taking testimony on the bill, the secretary of the Smithsonian uh, testified and, the, and the, senator, the chairman asked him how, whether they had Native American human remains in Smithsonian's collection and he said, oh yes, we have about 18,500 human remains of Alaska Natives, Native Hawaiians and American Indians. 
The idea was to create a national monument for those remains that could not be identified, much like the tomb of the unknown soldier. We quickly learned that the National Park Service had jurisdiction over the building of monuments on the mall. And we met with the National Park Service and they said, well, there's only one site left on the mall and that has been reserved for the Smithsonian for a, a museum of man. So we, we made a trip to New York in April of that year. The senator invited the secretary of the Smithsonian to come with us. The Smithsonian, once they saw the collection, had a very keen interest in acquiring that collection and bringing it down to Washington. The city and the state of New York resisted that idea, and the George Gustav Hay Trust required the museum to always have a presence in New York City. To make a long story short, we developed legislation to authorize the establishment of the museum. That was enacted into law in November of 1989. And in September of 2004, the museum opened. There were thousands of native people from North, Central, and South America that came to the National Mall. And I always get choked up when I talk about this, but because thousands of people dressed in their native dress walked toward the Capitol to reclaim their proper place in history. And it was incredibly moving to have all those people feel that they were reclaiming not only their proper place in history, but a principal place at the foot of the Capitol, the base of the Capitol, uh, a prominent place that, that Native people, the first Americans, rightfully deserved to occupy. I still am good with my native language, as taught by my elder. I come from a community on Lower Kuskokwim, Bethel area, and I was born in 1945, August 17th, a free indigenous man. I heard the birds calling, those were our food. When the salmon ends toward May, we look to them for food in spring camps. I was born to hunt freely in any direction that I wanted to hunt those blackfish pike that fed our family. And my parents tell me God gave us that resource to survive as an indigenous person. The Minnesota Indian Affairs Council is an agency of Minnesota that serves as a bridge to the 11 Native Nation governments located within the state boundaries. It has delegated the role of reaching out to these governments to nine Native American liaisons representing various departments within the state government. Their common goal is to ensure there is proper consultation between the nations and the state. On this summer day, the Boys Fort Heritage Center hosted the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council as members toured an exhibit. The state of Minnesota was the first in the nation to establish a statewide Indian Affairs Council. The Minnesota Indian Affairs Council uh, addresses uh, the government uh, between the Indian nations and the state government on a variety of issues and, and uh, it's important on working together on these issues, so uh, it creates a, a collaborative and, and uh, a council to discuss many issues. Primarily the design was to work on a government-to-government -government basis, the states with the tribes. And how we were originally designed, um, and this is very interesting, is um, we have two offices. We still have two offices that, that function in the state of Minnesota, one in Bemidji and one in St. Paul. But at the time when Indian Affairs was developed, those offices had 
two even more distinct roles than they do today. The office um, in the northern Minnesota, in Bemidji, was for the Ojibwe nations. So it was divided up Ojibwe and Dakota. And the St. Paul office was set up to run the four Dakota communities or to assist. I shouldn't say run because we are not running any tribe. Um, we are a liaison office in the state of Minnesota. But the St. Paul office was assisting the Dakota communities and the um, and the Bemidji office was designed to assist the Ojibwe communities. The council was established in 1963. The advisory board is made up of the 11 tribal chairs, a member of the governor's staff, and representatives from various state departments. I've worked for MnDOT for 11 years, and one of the things that uh, we've worked on is uh, getting ahead of problems and uh, establishing relations with the tribes, having meetings with the tribes, and laying out um, the plans that we have, uh, say our five-year plan, four-year plan, whatever it is, and letting tribes know that uh, what's coming up in the future. And one of the things that we've worked on is to fine-tune that, those meetings, to include not just the transportation people from the tribe, but also other uh, departments that may be uh, impacted. Um, for instance, their environmental department, they want to know what's coming up. Uh, the, the historical and cultural departments, they want to know what's happening because um, whatever we're doing may um, affect uh, their, their responsibilities. My job basically has me interact with tribal nations in terms of uh, letting them know what the responsibilities of the Department of Human Services are but also learning a little bit about what the vision and interests needs of the of the tribal leaders is and uh, trying to see if I can get those two to intersect. One example of, of how we are working with tribes also is in, in the white, with the White Earth Nation, we are actually transferring all health and human services responsibilities from three counties, Manoman, Clearwater, and Becker County. Uh, we're transferring all the responsibilities that previously were the, with the county over to the tribe. The tribe is going to be begin to be in the provider of all the services, everything from health care, mental health services, services for the elderly population, uh, child welfare activities, and, and, and recognizing in that way the, the uh, tribe as the provider of, of services. And, and uh, we're, we think it's really exciting, and we're, we're really thinking that there will be other tribes that are going to be interested in doing the same thing. You know, so. I think it's a, it's a huge project, you know, I mean, but the White Earth Nation is, is uh, very interested and, and their vision really is, is uh, about self-determination. With a large urban Indian population, the state of Minnesota Department of Human Services recognizes there are issues facing tribal members not living on the reservation. Well, as the tribes um, and the American Indian urban community um, express concerns or need to have uh, the health department work with them. Um, I would be the person to help facilitate that conversation directly with the health department and the tribes and urban Indian communities. Um, I would be the one-stop person, the one call to make, and I would then go to all the other divisions to pull them together as needed. Um, I think it's, it's been needed for a long time. Um, I think that now that that position is there that hopefully there will be a lot more partnerships going on around the issues, especially around the health disparities. Unfamiliarity with Native nations and their issues highlights the need for the liaisons and the Indian Affairs Council. Plus, there are tangible benefits in having such an organization in place. There was a big group of us um, who got together and put together a, a curriculum uh, of training to uh, the state legislature and I remember at that time when we were polling um, certain individuals cabinet level positions we were sitting down and said what would you think if we offer training Indian Affairs put together a little training day um, for you for legislators and one of the commissioners who had been a state legislator said you know that is just a wonderful idea she said you know, you come to the legislature and you don't even know where Indian tribes are on the map. And she said, and that is a dilemma 
because we sit there and we're supposed to know and we're supposed to know the laws and we don't even know where they are on the map. You're going to save the state money if you learn how to work with tribal governments, if you learn how um, treaties affect land, if you learn how the laws are affected. Um, people don't understand that very basic relationship in the state. In the design or in, in the intention of Indian Affairs and funding it through the state of Minnesota, the state is placing a value and continues to place a value on their relationship with Indian tribes in Minnesota. For more information about Native Report or the stories we've covered, look for us at nativereport.org and Facebook. Thank you for spending this time with your friends and neighbors in Indian Country. I'm Stacy Thunder. See you next time on Native Report. Stacy Thunder is a member of and legal counsel for the Red Lake Nation, and Tad Johnson is a member of the Boys Fort Band of Chippewa and is chair for the American Indian Studies Department on the campus of the University of Minnesota Duluth. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Medwakanton Sioux Community, the Malax Band of Ojibwe, and the Blandin Foundation.